Good morning and welcome to FPRI, Foreign Policy Research Institute's program this morning on the expansion of the BRICS countries. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with FPRI, uh, my name is Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. We're a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia, but with reach and with senior fellows and contributors from all around the world. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the BRICS uh, and the implications of their expansion. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the BRICS, uh, they are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Um, but to, joining us here today, we have a distinguished panel uh, that are joining us from all around the world, from everywhere from Switzerland to South Africa to uh, Indiana to Ireland and uh and, and of course the United States of America as well. Our panel today uh, will be moderated by Ambassador Charles Ray. Ambassador Ray is the chair of our Africa program and he is also a member of FPRI's board of trustees. And he also served as the ambassador, the US ambassador to the Republic of, of uh, Cambodia and to Zimbabwe as well as having a full State Department uh, career, as well as a full uh, military career before that. Um, and joining him today will be uh, Professor uh, pa Pareg uh, Carmody, uh, Professor Joshua Eisenman, uh, Ms. Yana de Kluiver, uh, Dr. Asebe Regassa, and Michael Walsh, who is one of our senior fellows here at FBRI. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ambassador Ray, but with a reminder that we will be taking your questions and answers. And I encourage you to put them in, in early because sometimes our participants look at, look at those Q and A's uh, and incorporate them into their comments. So um, anyway, without further ado, uh, Ambassador Ray. Uh, thank you and welcome to all of you. Uh, as was mentioned, we have, we have uh, panelists today who are basically all around the globe. Uh, we have uh, from Ireland to South Africa uh, to, to Switzerland. And uh, we're going to be talking about a, um, a program that is given that, that we have elections this year in both South Africa and the United States that will factor very largely uh, in the coming months uh, as campaigns in both countries heat up. And that's the expansion of BRICS and its implications, uh, not just for the new members and old members of BRICS, but also for the world economy and in particular the, the U.S. economy. I'm not going to repeat the bios of our panelists. Uh, they, they are on the site. You can read those. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask each of them to give about a two minute uh, introduction uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the issue before we go to the questions uh, that we hope will be many from the audience. And I see we have a really large audience today, about twice the number we usually have. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna ask um, Ms. Yana de Clover to uh, make her remarks. Uh, and I'm going strictly by the, the icons on my screen uh, in no particular protocol order, uh, followed by Michael Walsh, then Professor uh, uh, Sebe Regassa, uh, and uh, final uh, uh, Professor uh, Carmody, and then finally Professor Eisenman. So, uh, Mr. Decloyer, Decloyer, excuse me for butchering your name. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Ambassador. I think this is an honor to go first as well in introducing this very interesting topic with a lot of complex dynamics. As we know, um, at last year's BRICS conference in South Africa, there was an invitation extended to Saudi Arabia, Iran, Ethiopia, Egypt, Argentina, and the UAE to join the BRICS coalition. However, um, Argentina ultimately did not join BRICS this year um, and declined the invitation. However, we still have this expansion of five additional members that does carry significant weight. 
Um, the BRICS group, now with an expanded membership, covering about 43% of global oil production and representing about 45% of the world's population, is poised to exert substantial economic and geopolitical influence with the addition of major players like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the UAE. The group's dynamics in energy markets is reinforced, while its control over rare earth minerals strengthens its position in high-tech industries. However, amidst this expansion lies complexities and challenges. The inclusion of Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the UAE brings with its geopolitical tensions and human rights concerns. Additionally, the diverse political systems and conflicting interests within BRICS makes the consensus building a challenge, which is something that BRICS has been founded on and still functions on. Furthermore, this expansion carries broader implications beyond economic agendas. BRICS aims to leverage its collective economic weight to challenge the existing global order, evident in initiatives like the New Development Bank. Yet domestic challenges with BRICS, coupled with geopolitical tensions, pose obstacles to deeper integration and altercations of the global power balance. In the context of US-China relations, the BRICS expansion adds a layer of complexity. While some, some may view it as a challenge to US dominance, others argue that it underscores the need for the US to engage more effectively with the rest of the world. This expansion also raises questions about China's role in BRICS and its bilateral dynamics with India, potentially impacting a consensus in critical issues. However, in my humble opinion, I think that although we are not going to see drastic changes by this BRICS expansion in terms of the global world order, I do think that this is an indication of something that will increasingly be prevalent in the years going forward. Something that is not to be missed is the fact that if nothing else, it does mean that stakeholders will increasingly engage in yearly summits of about a hundred different meetings for a plethora of different reasons. And this increased linkages between the BRICS plus coalition will certainly show in how alliances develop going forward. In conclusion, I'd say the BRICS expansion holds both opportunities and challenges for China, as well as US-China relations and the global economy as a whole. And as we navigate this landscape, it's essential to engage in constructive dialogue and cooperation to address shared challenges and harness the potential benefits of a more multi multipolar world. I think that would just be some of my opening remarks on this very complex topic. Thank you. Michael. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Um, I'm here to, to talk a little bit about the, the conceptual, theoretical, and empirical side of, of making sense of this idea of, of the impact of the BRICS expansion on the current world order. So when you hear commentators talk, they often talk about how the recent expansion is marking a significant step towards a new world order. I find that to be a remarkable claim that demands a lot of scrutiny from the scholarly community. Uh, I created this new conceptual framework to try to help make sense of this. And so today I'm here to talk a little bit about the conceptual framework and about how it applies in the context of our, our conversation today. So when you think about the international system, we often think of the international system as having states as the nodes and the relationships between states as their edges. Um, but one of the things we do for simplica simplification purposes is we often think of it as a non-overlapping community network. And by that, we mean that that each state only belongs to a single community at one time when we do modularity analysis. Um, but the reality is, is and we've seen this, um, you know, especially in the context of BRICS, is that states uh, belong to multiple communities at the same time. And so the simplification of the international system down to a non-overlapping community network is a, is a flawed assumption, and it would be a mistake. And so we need to look at the international system as an overlapping community network in order to make sense of how the, the BRICS expansion is going to impact the current world order. So once we make that step, the next step that we have to make is to, to think about, you know, what do the states, um, what is their influence within this network? Uh, and so there's two dimensions of influence. There's the, and then they're really at two levels. Uh, so at the first level, when we talk about the influence of sovereign states, we think about within their communities. So they're members of some communities, but not all. So states have influence within those communities. Then they have influence on other states who are not part of their communities. And so when we talk about the expansion of BRICS, what's happening is these other states that are coming into BRICS are now going to bring with them the influence they have in their communities that already exist, as well as their influence on other states. So we have to think about how that's changing the influence of the BRICS as a collective. 
Um, and so that's an important point of analysis. But I think a second point of analysis, because we're talking about the world order, is to, to think about the dimensions of competition. And there's three dimensions of competition that I think are really relevant in the context of the BRICS. The first is, you know, who should be in the field of contestants? And that's not just sovereign states, as we see with Ethiopia, with Somaliland, it also includes non-sovereign nations. And so this question of who should be the field of contestants really matters in the context of competition. The second one is, what should be the rules of the game? And we see this normatively. You know, I mean, right now in Gaza, we see this question being asked about humanitarian access. Um, but all of these norms matter. And so what are the rules by which we're, we're, we're playing this game in the international system? And then the third, I think, really important dimension to think about is what is the ultimate objective of the competition that's happening? You know, is it zero sum? Are we just trying to acquire as much power and material wealth as possible? Is that the game we're playing? Or is there some other game we're playing? And so when we talk about remaking the world order, we're talking about remaking uh, this, this nature of competition, both within the communities that you're a part of, but also within the entire international system. And so we need to think about these countries who are coming into the BRICS you know, how do they view competition? And then we need to look forward. And that's where we really get to these set of research questions. You can find the, the working paper uh, on the website with the event. But I think it's really three types of questions we need to ask. Some are descriptive. So we need to ask, what is the impact of this expansion going to be on the influence of these states, but also the existing BRICS members and non-BRICS members um, or non-BRICS states, as well as non-sovereign nations like Somaliland. Um, then we have to ask, you know, what is the stance of this? So what's the impact on the stance um, going to be as a result of this expansion for all four of those entities again? Normatively, we have to look at both the present and the future and ask what should be the influence of each of these four entities? Uh, and then we have to look at the same question for their stance on competition. What should be their stance on competition? And that's going to come from your, a point of view of an actor. And then finally, I think, and I'll end with this, is the predictive questions. So in the future, what is going to be the influence of these new BRICS members? What's going to be the influence of the existing BRICS members? What's going to be the influence of the non-BRICS member states? And what's going to be the, the influence of the non-sovereign nations within their communities, as well as within the wider international system? And the same questions have to be asked again about their competitive stances. And so I think when we're talking about the expansion of the BRICS and what it means for the world, we have to look at it through a conceptual framework. And I've tried to propose one. There will be others proposed, I'm sure, in the, in the future as well. But I think it's important to ground our scholarly inquiries in these conceptual frameworks and not just on, on opinions and, and sort of ad hoc remarks. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Ragasa? Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to expand this uh, uh, discussion to a conceptual contribution uh, using frontier expansion as a, as a framework. Uh, I frame the BRICS expansion as a new geopolitical uh, frontier, uh, which is advanced by Russia and China. And my focus will be uh, on the Horn of Africa, especially to avoid the general discussion what other panelists have uh, already made. So uh, in this conceptualization, the Horn of Africa is uh, really an, a kind of part of a traditional frontier, which is, which is a geopolitically very significant. It gives access to the Indian Ocean, to the Middle East, uh, strategically, economically, as well as uh, in, in terms of security, which we uh, observed from a, a colonial period until, until today. Uh, for example, Djibouti is the best example as being a frontier state uh, uh, today. Over a kind of a dozen international powers are, are having military base in Djibouti. And Somaliland would be the, another very uh, interesting site. And that is why the concept of frontiers and the frontier making is very uh, relevant in this understanding. And I want to conceptualize uh, a little bit of what I mean frontier uh, is from a historical perspective that it has been part of a colonial and empire building project. But it is also part of the political economy of uh, resource extraction. But generally, from a geopolitical perspective, we can understand frontiers as uh, a project 
that is advanced by multinational corporations or by states like China and Russia now, uh, or by the former BRICS states to control space, spaces, populations, and uh, sovereign states for their advancement of uh, enrolling these states and the spaces into a certain regional or uh, global hegemony. And in a in a frontier making process, one very important uh, aspect is the role of frontier actors. Pro frontier actors are like Ethiopia, for example. It doesn't it doesn't take place in a liminal process, but it needs actors who have also their own ambition. In the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia has uh, ambition to be a regional hegemon. And that is why it becomes very relevant for the former uh, BRICS states in order to uh, achieve their, their uh, geopolitical interests. And uh, frontier actors usually use violence in, uh, in achieving their control over spaces or even over non-sovereign uh, non states, like what Ethiopia is doing against uh, uh, Somaliland or uh, it is claimed uh, currently about access to the sea, for example. So the implication in general is when such major and emerging geopolitical powers like China and Russia, as I've, I've mentioned, advance their uh, spheres of influence in, into the Horn of Africa, the implication is it might destabilize existing regional institutions could be IGAD or even the continental institution like AU, the African Union, because it adds different layers of complexity over already existing complex uh, power relations. So I, I would come to the, uh, the specific uh, implications, what it has for Ethiopia, what it might have uh, for, for uh, the Horn of Africa, but Frontiers might also strike back, and that is where uh, the issue or the understanding of conflict would be uh, important. Frontiers strike back means there would be conflict, resistance. What we, we are observing, for example, the resistance from Somalia against Ethiopia's signing of agreement with Somaliland is one example, which might lead to regional conflict, having, for example, another BRICS member like Egypt in, into this uh, tension. Thank you for a moment. All right, thank you. Uh, Professor Carmody? Or is it Carmody, That's I'm sorry. Carmody, yes. Uh, thanks, Ambassador Ray. So I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, I suppose one of the first things to address is what is the BRICS before we talk about its expansion? And it's a largely informal uh, soft coordination mechanism, I'd say, with formal elements. Um, it claims a representative function, so it's important geopolitically, uh, less so perhaps materially. According to some commentators, the BRICS have never done much and never will, but I think that is to understate uh, the nature of what it is. I think it has a different mode of operation from other more formalized geopolitical blocks or alliances, which allows the members to operate with the variable geometry, with the overall goal of creating what I call a govosphere, which is an attempt to reshape the rules of the international order to allow operating space or create an operating system, which allows for more policy autonomy for good and bad by BRICS headquartered or centered actors. In terms of the expansion, I suppose the question should be asked why now? And I think we have to see that, no surprise, in the context of enhanced geopolitical competition between China, Russia, Russia and the West, as already has been referenced. We can see the US response to that enhanced competition uh, through the bolstering of alliances and the creations of new ones like the AUKUS Alliance, which shares military technology between the US, UK and Australia. And in a sense, the BRICS expansion could be seen as an equal and opposite reaction to the uh, reaction of the United States to the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. I also think the expansion is an attempt to try and securitize energy supplies by admitting major oil producers or those with uh, 
uh, energy reserves uh, like Iran, even if it's not a major producer. It's an attempt to uh, potentially advance the de-dollarization agenda and de-risk uh, the effectiveness of potential US sanctions if there's a future conflict over Taiwan, for example, through the correspondent uh, banking system. So we can see the BRICS expansion as an outcome of structural changes to the global political economy, which it may reinforce, and particular related uh, conjunctural events. Now, just to finish up, will this increase the power of the BRICS? Um, Yes and no. As I said, the, the BRICS is an informal kind of thing with a variable geometry, but it allows perhaps for increased bilateral exchanges. So, for example, shortly after the BRICS expansion was announced, Ethiopia uh, announced that it would be hosting a Russian car manufacturing plant to make ladders. It's a state-owned Russian uh, corporation. So that is an example of the kind of potential for this greater interchange uh, and also for, um, you know, greater operating space and cooperation amongst the members. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, uh, Professor Eisenman. Thank you. And thanks to my fellow panelists for those uh, excellent remarks. I'm glad you guys set a lot of the stage here in, in uh, Professor Carmody defining the BRICS. That's helpful. I study the Communist Party of China, so maybe I'll start there. Um, the Communist Party of China is a political organization first. Um, its economics, its uh, security, its politics are all part of an effort to enhance its own power. And it does this in one way through what it calls United Front Tactics. And when it does this, it identifies a primary contradiction. China has identified that primary contradiction as the United States. And it is within this context that BRICS is part of a larger Gulliver strategy to constrain U.S. unilateralism. Um, we could also, uh, China also calls this the democratization of international relations. But in any case, it's part of this constraining of U.S. hegemony or what China calls U.S. hegemony. Um, so the expansion of BRICS can be seen in this context, a kind of club of constrainers. And so a couple of points on this. First, I see BRICS as an avenue primarily for anti-U.S. and anti-Western grievance, not as a place for real policy solutions, at least not at this time. We're very clear what they're against. It's very unclear what they are for. In this way, they somewhat remind me of the GOP in the United States right now. Secondly, China wishes to demonstrate leadership through the BRICS, but with a slowing economy and with the BRI facing problems in terms of recouping its losses and becoming more small and beautiful, as China calls it, it's hard to understand how the money is going to be behind the BRICS. Um, a lot of the, uh, you know, certainly the Russian economy is not going to be backing it. Um, and the other economies are simply not comparable to the West in any significant way on paper. So if the Chinese economy continues to falter, the BRICS will continue to falter. These, the fate of these two is tied together. Third, BRICS um, is facing uh, you know, some problems, right? Um, Argentina, as was mentioned, pulled out of BRICS. That never a good sign when you cannot expand as much as you thought. And we all know the reasons, domestic, et cetera. But the fact is, if Argentina had thought BRICS in its own interests, it may well have continued or there would have been pressure. Second, India was very clear that it's not for a BRICS currency. And that is a killer for me. If you can't get India on board, one of the fastest growing economies, you know, uh, the UAE ain't going to do it for you. So ultimately, if India not on board in the currency, I, I have little faith. And, and finally, uh, this expansion of the BRICS New Development Bank, it kind of reminds me of the AIIB, another bank established and set up in Beijing. The other, you know, what is it, a year ago, the vice president literally got on a plane and flew out of China un without notice, right? The idea of setting up international development banks in the People's Republic of China ain't going to work, guys. And if that is what they're going to do, then I see no hope. Um, so frankly, uh, under that kind of regulatory security led environment, I cannot see uh, success there. And final point is that with Russia preparing to host the next BRICS, Russia wishes to harness the BRICS to defend its own revanchist uh, claims in Ukraine. And so China has its interests, but Russian interests aren't necessarily Chinese interests in this regard. And so if Russia wants to utilize BRICS to defend its revanchism in Ukraine, that would seem to undermine the BRICS's ability to engage economically around the world because it'll be pulled into these geostrategic tensions and problems. And then 
Ultra finally, if you just look at these nations, and I think this was mentioned, Ethiopia and Egypt have serious tensions. Saudi Arabia and Iran have serious tensions. It's hard to imagine how these guys sing Kumbaya and run forward anytime soon. So anyway, thanks, guys. Uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, all of you. That's that's very interesting. I, As I was listening to all of you talk, what I heard was that that the BRICS, especially the expanded BRICS, rather than being a constructive economic block that we should be concerned about, it sounds more like a club of disruptors being expanded to create more difficulties for, for those of us in the West. Uh, I'd like to start, say, with uh, Professor Carmody. Uh, what, how, how, do you, how do you look at, uh, just as, as Professor Eisman said, uh, you have new members who, who become members of a club. They've never gotten along with each other. How will they get along in the confines of this disruptive mm. club? What's, yeah. your, what's your view on that? So I think um, Joshua is right in, in some ways that you know what unites them is clearer um, in terms of opposition to Western dominance. But I think they're, you know, uh, there's a broader discussion around are the BRICS offensive, defensive, developmental, a combination of those things. Um, you know, there is an overdue discussion about the international order. Um, President De Silva of Brazil said at the BRICS summit, it was about getting themselves organized. That is the global south to address um, lack of equity in international institutions, you know, very unbalanced international relations. Um, and Fiona Hill, uh, who was, uh, I guess, in the Trump administration and is now Chancellor of Durham University, has talked about the need to rebalance the international order away from a Western-centred one, which we've had for hundreds of years, which was not representative, was associated with very high levels of inequality, towards one now that is more representative because we live not just because we live in a multipolar world, but also because it's an issue of justice. So I think there are positive and negative aspects uh, to the BRICS expansion. Whether they will get along, in a sense, is moot. Um, India and China regularly engage in border clashes, for example, sometimes resulting in fatalities. So they're, they're both co uh, cooperative and competitive amongst the group. So they have areas where they will see alignment of their interests and values and other areas where they will compete and disagree. And what the BRICS structure allows is for that coordination to take place where it's useful, but still to have the competition uh, where interests uh, are, are variegated amongst the group. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kloiver, uh, as, as you were in South Africa, uh, I, I, this question that was in my mind from the very start uh, is probably more appropriate to you. As South Africa has an election upcoming, and so does the U.S., and right now the U.S. and South Africa are involved in a, in a bit of a, a dance to decide whether we continue dancing or not uh, with, and, and there are domestic implications that are created by these upcoming elections. How do you look at the various domestic influences on both sides of South Africa, the South Africa US equation, and how that might impact where BRICS stumbles to in the coming decades or in the coming months even? Thank you, Ambassador. I think that's an excellent question. And it's something we also grapple with internally when it comes to South Africa's current foreign policy towards the shifting global dynamics. Um, and I dare say sometimes it lacks a bit of diplomacy in terms of how we pick our friends and what issues we ultimately decide to engage on. I think with regards to BRICS um, and our internal elections, I think we are likely to still see a government in terms of the ANC just just winning by a majority and increasingly viewing um, our friends from the South um, and preferring to remain within the BRICS coalition and remaining within these spaces and promoting a global South narrative, um, as opposed to, um, for example, our biggest opposition party, the DA, which might have a more Western-centric um, view of our foreign policy. However, they aren't likely to come into power in this coming election. And I think we are going to see an increasing move away from countries such as the US 
towards um, working with in the BRICS coalition. I think something that would be interesting to see how South Africa ultimately engages in the new BRICS, since we are no longer the African voice. We have two other African countries joining. So to see how we conceptualize our own role within BRICS and what we can ultimately bring to the table, given that we aren't um, nearly one of the biggest economies and within this space, and that there are numerous cha internal challenges that we are also grappling with. So I think it would be very interesting to see how we ultimately look at these dynamics going forward. But I do see a worsening relationship between South Africa and the US. And I think our um, prospects for AGOA is getting weaker the more we side within this BRICS coalition. So I think in that sense, it might have quite a bit of a negative economic impact for us. Thank you. Uh, I see we have a lot of questions in the Q&A box, and I would like to try and get to as many of them as possible. So at this point, I will turn it over to President Flynn, who will moderate the questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Ray. Interesting discussion. Um, we have a couple of questions that um, center around currencies, and I'm going to combine them. And uh, I'm not sure who the best person to answer this is going to be, so um, I'll welcome you raising your hands. <laughs> First, what does a potential BRICS, BRICS basket currency mean for the USD, the US dollar reserve currency dominance in international trade? Second question, will the expansion create momentum for alternatives to dollar denominated trading, especially for oil? So two really important questions. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Eisenman. Uh, you're muted. Always forget to to unmute. Sorry, guys. Um, let me just. I'll be try. I'll try to be very brief on this because, frankly, I think it's not realistic, and I think it's pie in the sky. Right, a bricks basket currency. I I would be shocked if it even occurs in my lifetime, uh, because we've never seen anything quite like that. Um, the combination of these disparate nations, who, as was mentioned, may well come to war with each other, um, to have some kind of common currency. Where would the central bank be located? Um, you know, to me, again, this is just an indicator of the lack of seriousness of the BRICS. Um, the minute it came out, India said it ain't going to happen, and as I said in my comments, I just think that. It's all it does suggest is that there's a kind of a lack of strategic thinking behind what is the realm of the possible. Um, and so, I, I mean, maybe I'll just say, yes, if it were concluded, like if, 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 and if, then yes, it would be a challenge, but I don't see it in the offing. And and one other thing I want to add here is, because um, this was one of my fellow comments uh, uh, presenters had mentioned this, this idea of the kind of rising global south. Um, to me, I'm deeply concerned that um, that leaders in the global south are being manipulated through emotion to do things that are not necessarily in their best interest and make choices that are actually in the antithetical to their growth. And so to me, this emotion of anti-colonial narratives by China, which is in many ways a colonial power in its own right, um, is to me uh, really disturbing. And I really hope that folks in the global south can deconstruct this narrative a little bit because i feel like they're being led down the primrose path to support uh china and russia in ways that are not necessarily beneficial to them in the future and that might sound like i'm sitting here in indiana telling global south countries what's in their interest but as a scholar um i'm concerned with some of the kind of emotion driven politics that i think are being uh kind of behind a lot of this and i think that applies to the currency as well uh which is again more anti-american than it is realistic in my opinion any any other comments from our um, panel on that? Yeah. I could yes. I could come in there. Um, so I suppose there there have been a variety of things discussed in relation to this. As uh, Professor Eisenman was saying, it's not really realistic to have one common currency like the euro, for example, because there would have to be a central bank and the economic structures and fundamentals and conditions across the BRICS are so diverse that simply wouldn't be feasible or desirable from a kind of developmental or economic point of view. The basket currency idea I haven't heard before, but it's, it strikes me as something which is similar to the idea of special drawing rights from the International Monetary Fund. They're not actually a currency because to have a currency, you, you have to have a central bank which kind of sets interest rates on it. So it's slightly different. There are two things which have been raised though. One is a trade currency and a trade currency is where you have a currency that you use for external trade 
between the members of the grouping. And there is some precedent for that. So CARICOM in the Caribbean has a trade currency, for example. The second is whether there could be a common cryptocurrency. Um, and this uh, has been floated as well. There's already a digital one, and it might be easier to have a common cryptocurrency, which would be freely exchangeable for other currencies uh, around the world. And in terms of, of de-dollarization and you know, the potential impacts of the BRICS expansion on that, India and UAE are already conducting their trade in their home currencies. So we do see evidence of some de-dollarization, uh, particularly in the, in the oil market. And oil is the world's most important traded commodity. I think it's several times bigger than the 10 biggest metals trades uh, combined. So de-dollarization could have a potential impact there. And obviously that would dent the privilege of uh, US seniorage, where it can basically print money and buy things from the rest of the world for free. So it, there are potential long-term implications there. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's go to the next question. Um, is it possible that the BRICS are enhancing Russia's and China's ability to prevail in its concept of geopolitical world order? Uh, why don't we hear from um, some of the other panelists we have today? Who, who, uh, yes, go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. This is uh, an interesting question also uh, related to the point I mentioned at the beginning. It is a geopolitical frontier making. Uh, so this is a project of Russia and China mainly, uh, in which they want to expand their uh, economic interests, their uh, geopolitical power uh, or hegemony to the, to the rest of the world, particularly to the global south. And they, they make this by enrolling the new members who have also their own ambition to become regional hegemons like Ethiopia, for example, or uh, Egypt by, by, by itself and other, other uh, uh, new members which were included. So uh, although there are tensions which could be potentially, uh, which could uh, deter the the Russia and the Chinese hegemony in that context, uh, that there would be a potential to challenge at least the, the US-led uh, Western domination, because many of these new members and others maybe, which, which uh, already submitted their, uh, their application, have this discourse and the narrative of the Western domination in the global uh, power relations. Although that Western domination is true, uh, but the new or BRICS doesn't also represent the global South's opinions and uh, interest because as it has been uh, said before, China is a new colonial power for that matter. It is uh, one of the most uh, uh, kind of dominant in terms of extractive industries in Africa, for example, uh, without any concern for, uh, for, for environment, without any concern for human rights. And I don't see that would uh, align the, the, the interests of the global South, but in one way or another, because of this grievance that they, they share, uh, they might, they might uh, exercise that control uh, for, for, for some time. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Um, what conditions need to be met for the BRICS to actually emerge as a significant geopolitical actor, I can say to the G7? Who'd like to take that? Um, I can take that. Um, so I think this gets back to the conceptual model. I mean, one of the really important things that you have to consider is uh, the alignment that exists between the, uh, the BRICS member states on, on who should be part of the, the international system making the decisions at the top level and what should be the rules that govern their, their interactions and what are they trying to compete to achieve. And so ultimately there needs to be alignment, um, deep alignment. So it has to be uh, broad and deep and that needs to exist. And to get back to what Asabe just talked about with the, with the frontier, um, Sudan's the, the ideal case right now for understanding sort of the challenges that the BRICS is going to face. 
you know, to their east, they have Saudi Arabia, to the north, they have Egypt, to the south, they have Ethiopia, three members of the, the BRICS um, community, um, two of them, the, you know, I guess all three of them expanded members of the BRICS community. Um, and, you know, you have UAE also engaged in, in you know, active competition in, in Sudan. Uh, so you basically have four members plus Russia, um, you know, actively contesting the future of, of Sudan right now. And so when you look at sort of what needs to happen for the BRICS to emerge as a major power, if they can't align on Sudan and they can't align on the future of Sudan, um, you know, it's not going to bode very well for the short term uh, for, for the BRICS uh, consolidating and becoming a stronger power. Um, now, I mean, Sudan is a, is a case, so it doesn't determine the future of the BRICS by any stretch of the imagination. But it's a useful case to just show on this frontier, uh, to use Asabe's terms, uh, where there's a deterioration of the power of a sovereign state that's not part of the BRICS, and you have neighboring BRICS member states who, who desire to affect the outcome of events in that state, uh, and, and non-neighbor states, including Russia, who's a major player in all of this, uh, um, you know, you, you can't, you don't see alignment right now. And so if the BRICS can't achieve alignment on Sudan, then the question is, what other geopolitical things can they achieve alignment on? Yeah. Uh, Yana, would you like to comment on any of these questions that we've talked about? No, certainly. Um, I think a very interesting concept with regards to what does BRICS need to do to be more effective? I think it's important to remember that there is no legal binding um, aspect to the BRICS coalition. This is a loose coalition. Um, so, for example, it would not be a similar function to NATO um, in the case that there would be a US or China conflict. The other BRICS members would not be pulled in to assist in this. There's not that full formal economic um, and security aspect towards this cooperation. So I think it's important to keep in mind for what BRICS is. I think it's part of a bigger movement. And a lot of times with the new members joining into the BRICS coalition, ultimately, because there is no legal underpinning to it, it ultimately indicates that they can choose to engage or not engage. Although, of course, we know there's nuances such as geopolitical um, pressures, there is economic pressures coming from China or Russia, for example. But at its core, it's still a voluntary initiative. And I think this is important to remember that the states engaging in this also have their own agency with regards to making decisions that ultimately best benefit them. So BRICS, at least for me and my analysis, it's oftentimes easy to take a, easier to take a step back and understand that it is not necessarily attempting to function in the space of the G7, but rather just voice concerns coming from global South countries, all of their own initiatives and their own agendas, but ultimately saying that we want a greater voice in the international world system. Thank you. You know, as I'm listening, uh, I'm reminded of what I consider the the old non-aligned movement of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And I realize the non-aligned movement still exists, but I don't think of it in, in the same way as it did. Is this more akin to a non-aligned movement of, of the way it used to be than of, you know, something like the G7? Anyone can, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Eisen. Yeah, I mean, I just want to, uh, if I might just build on quickly the comment that uh, uh, Michael made about Sudan. I see a similar dynamic in, in the Red Sea, which is to say that here we have the Red Sea, uh, the Houthi situation, surrounded by all the BRICS members, the new BRICS members. Um, China's being hurt. India's being hurt. Egypt is being hurt. Iran is part is majority the cause. But these members have not been able to lean on Iran or to get the solution. So the United States has put together a coalition. And I think this is a kind of an, another case, we could say, in addition to Sudan, that suggests that the BRICS is literally surrounding the problem, but its members are at odds. And so we can see that its ability to be effective in terms of managing uh, solutions to critical issues when your China and your economy is faltering, you need access to Europe and India, et cetera. So um, that gets to your point. I do think you're right. I do think that this might be uh, akin to a kind of new aligned, non-aligned movement, uh, or, but maybe even uh, more 
clearly anti-Western, right? Maybe then, you know, the new, the non-aligned movement, although it said non-aligned, did have a kind of anti-Western independent tinge to it. But this is declaratively anti-U.S., right? And um, because it's declaratively U.S., I would say it's a step you know, in the more uh, uh, confrontational uh, approach. And certainly we can see the U.S. intention with Iran, um, uh, you know, with China, with Russia. These tensions go beyond, I think, the tensions with the non-aligned movement. So I would say there are elements of that, to be sure, in terms of the effort to lead the global south. But I would suggest this is more about, um, as I think um, was said earlier, this idea of building a, a counter world order that is going to challenge the U.S. Western dominated what we call the rules based order. And China has a name for it. It's called the community of shared future for mankind. And so this is an element of that. It's a pillar in China's effort to create an alternative world order with itself at the center of that order, which is not bounded by rules, but bounded by relationships, relationality and your closeness to Beijing. Do you think, though, as it enlarges, it's going to, uh, assuming it does enlarge ultimately, uh, that it's going to have to temper some of that, some of those ambitions? Anyone else who wants to pipe up in here? Uh, Padre? I think My Michael has his hand up. Michael, did you want to? Go oh, first? yes. Go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to continue um, Professor Eiserman's comment there for a second, though, but then I'll let you answer that question. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, the interesting things when we look at the system is the context. Um, you know, when we're talking about the non-aligned movement, it happened in a different world. That was a, a bipolar world, right? We're in a decaying unipolar world. And so the world that the non-aligned system existed in was fundamentally different than the system that we live in today. And so I don't think you can draw parallels between the two of them for that precise reason. Um, in fact, I think that to a large extent, the reason why we have a more hostile anti-Western, um, you know, BRIC system in relation to the, the non-aligned movement is because there is no counterweight to that decaying unipolar world that we live in. And, and there's a lot of hostility within these states towards U.S. policy over the last 20 years. Um, and so it's being manifest through this system. And when we talked about UAE a few minutes ago, I mean, we've gone from a period in, in less than a decade where U.S. and UAE relations were extremely close to a state of affairs where there is truly, you know, clear competition happening between the U UAE and the United States now in the world. Um, and that's a regional power. That's not even a major competitor. Um, but it is a regional power who's behaving like a major competitor in the international system. And that's a huge shift. And, you know, we didn't have regional powers trying to go head to head with either the USSR or the United States during the Cold War. Um, and I think that this is this is something that's fundamentally shifting in the international system. And I think part of that is because the context is different. And I think that the amount of decay that's happened in the unipolar world we've lived in since September 11th has emboldened some of these actors to be even more aggressively anti-Western. Um, and I think that that's part of um, one of the things that needs to get mitigated in order to restore some balance to the system and to avoid high-end conflict. Any other comments on that? Yeah, maybe I can, I can come in there. Um, so I suppose I disagree a little bit with Joshua about the BRICS being a necessarily anti-Western group. I think the different members have different uh, perceptions of what the group is and what it does for them. For Russia, certainly, it's perceived to be an anti-Western group. Um, for South Africa, for India, for some of the other democracies in it, that's not so much the case. People refer to this idea of omni-alignment now, that countries want to leverage good relations with both the East and the West for their own economic development benefit and policy autonomy. Um, if we look at what the BRICS is, and I think Yana is right about this, you know, it's very different from something like the G7, which operates under the US security umbrella. There are no real strategic issues between the members of the G7. Um, and it's, it's also a largely economically focused kind of grouping. But if you look at something like the EU, which is much more institutionalized, formalized, 
it has severe problems getting agreement amongst its members. I, I was watching an interview recently where one of the analysts was saying, the only thing that can get the EU to agree is a kind of existential security threat, like the Russian invasion of Ukraine or a potential Trump presidency, they were saying, uh, in the United States. That's That concentrates people's minds and, and they cooperate. But other than that, they still, a lot of countries still pursue their national agenda and interests within the, the kind of envelope um, of the European Union. So I think they're they're very different. And as Joshua was saying, it, you know, it's, it'll be very difficult for them to become strategically aligned because of their com competition, where they're located, you know, and, and all sorts of other things. Uh, uh, another question, what are the reasons why Saudi Arabia has not yet fully committed to the BRICS organization? Who would like to take that? Um, Jana, do you want to comment on that? Um, I think with regards to specifically the Saudi Arabia case, um, I haven't really been keeping up to date or that I was aware that they are necessarily lagging behind where the other countries are at the moment. I think something that's very much a challenge when analyzing this is that the agenda has not fully been set for what this year will look like in terms of um, the engagements with BRICS. And we'll see as it unfolds how they ultimately engage with these new members and what that entails. I think a hesitancy from all of the new members is to be expected. A lot of them are regional powers in their own rights and also have their own interests ultimately that needs to be safeguarded. And it's within this confine that I think um, hesitation comes in to truly make sure that they are also leveraging different engagements between different actors, for example, traditional relationships more towards the West, as well as relationships towards the East, and finding a middle ground for this. Dr. Ragasa? Yeah, uh, I don't also make a specific uh, remark on that, but uh, to generalize, I think this part of the ambivalence that many of the new members have uh, or some of them at least because of their uh, position and and alliance with uh, with with the West, uh, I think they might also continue to face uh, this ambivalence in in the future. For example, Ethiopia, UAE, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. They, they have been the kind of good friends and partners with uh, with the US and with the, with the West in general. And I mean, uh, uh, despite many uh, frictions at different times, so although uh, they might, whether emotionally or strategically, they they might have uh, chosen to to join BRICS, then that they continue to face this uh, challenge of choosing between the 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 West economically and uh, for security reasons, and also uh, the new uh, blocks. I mean, continuing in BRICS. And that Saudi Arabia's case could be seen within that uh, that dilemma, I think. Uh, and I would add that when it comes to the Saudi Arabia question, I mean, we can put forward hypotheses. I don't think anyone on this panel could answer definitively why Saudi Arabia uh, contradicted what the government of South Africa said about them joining BRICS. Um, it was a very quick response, which said we have not yet joined, um, but they didn't really clarify the grounds for why they, they made that statement. I think the reality is, is that Saudi Arabia is in a different position than a lot of the other countries and that A, that they're a powerful country in, in the global stage. Um, and they have the ability to, to move markets with, with these sort of decisions. Um, and they also have the current issue going on in Gaza and they're playing a, a big role in in trying to uh, to address that. They have the Yemen situation going on. They've got a lot of variables um, at play at one time. And they're a traditionally conservative decision-making country. And so I think to some extent, you know, slowing down the, the train and, uh, and leaving your options open in a rapidly changing world that extremes, seems extremely destabilized and, and conflict-ridden is probably the right move for them. Uh, and so I think they're moving down that direction. Uh, and I think they also don't have the same ax to grind that, say, a UAE does. You know, UAE was very upset about the ballistic missile defense uh, decisions of the United States following the the attacks by by the Houthi on on uh, on Abu Dhabi. and uh, and Saudi Arabia was as well. 
Uh, but Saudi Arabia has moved past a lot of that. And I don't think we've seen the UAE move past it quite as far as, as Saudi has. Um, sort of to wrap things up, could you comment, all of you, on the key indicators we should watch as to whether BRICS is going to succeed as a movement or or take a completely, you know, a more dynamic turn one way or the other? Um, so what what we should should be looking for in the next, say, five, ten years as we as we watch this movement? So maybe I could give you three quick ones as a list, because uh, I was just writing that down, actually, as you asked the question. So I'm on the same page. One I already mentioned is the Chinese economy. If the Chinese economy doesn't thrive, I can't imagine BRICS will thrive. Second, views of China globally have been falling, particularly in Africa and Southeast Asia, Europe, etc. In those views continue to fall, I do not believe BRICS can thrive. And then the third is, if Russia is successful in this next BRICS summit in bringing BRICS into a kind of full revanchism, where it actually is fully aligned 100% in an anti-Western way and essentially carrying water for Russian uh, efforts in Ukraine. If, if Russia is successful in doing that, then I don't think that's in China's interest or BRICS interest. So those are the three I would give quickly. Okay. A anyone else want to comment on that? Sure. So... I think uh, Professor Eisman is right about the Chinese economy, but I think they've recalibrated now their strategy towards something that Lina Ben Abdallah calls elite capture. That is um, targeting elites uh, in countries in the global south for preferences, favors, uh, you know, that allow regime maintenance um, or survival. So as the money kind of dwindles down a bit, uh, you know, they're recalibrating that. And I think that can be an effective uh, strategy. And there, there, there are new initiatives like the governance school set up by the Chinese Communist Party in Tanzania to try and encourage a particular model of state society relations uh, and, and promote party state fusion and so on. Um, that being said, I think the world economy will continue to multipolarize. And um, I think then, BRICS may evolve. China's China accounted for, I read the other day, 66% of total economic output of the BRICS prior to the expansion as the Chinese economy has slowed. And if that continues, you know, but other centers like UAE and others emerge, the relative power balances may shift and it may actually change the dynamic in the grouping uh, in unknown ways. I'll leave there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Ragasa, you have your hand up. And as uh, we continue. We have about two more minutes. I, including your comments, what approach do you think the United States should take? Uh, go ahead, Dr. Ragasa. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, the, the kind of one or two indicators I, I would mention uh, for the success of uh, BRICS is one about whether the new members or uh, other members who are applying for, for uh, the membership, whether they succeed uh, there is economic or other strategic interests, uh, and whether the major members of the BRICS, like Russia or China, could accommodate the interests of these uh, new members. I think that would be very important indicator to uh, for the success. And also, if it is serves as a platform to kind of negotiate and mediate tensions within the uh, member uh, states, like uh, the relationship between. Ethiopia, Egypt, or uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and, and so on. If it, if it serves as a platform for discussion, deliberation, I think that would also attract new, new members. For the United States, uh, what it should do, I think, uh, well, it, there is a very clear historical uh, reason and the grievance from the Global South. I'm not saying about the, the BRIC members as such, but from the Global South about US hegemony. Uh, in the global relations. I think U.S. should reconsider its relationship with the global South in terms of its uh, uh, strategic uh, relations, its uh, economic relations and, and uh, others, so that it would be accepted. Uh, because that is what Russia and, the, and China are using as, a, as a, a mobilization of new members into the BRICS. Thank you. We are officially out of time, uh, but... Um... 
Uh, we still have two hands up. So Yana and Michael, can you just quickly in 20 seconds, give your spiel? Yana? I think just quickly to answer both of them, whether or not we're going to see BRICS going forward is truly a force to be reckoned with will be whether or not they can find common ground and if they can find a sense of identity of what is BRICS outside of just being a proxy for Russia, a proxy for China, anti-US. I think that's at its core going to be whether or not BRICS is something sustainable and it's going to gain traction or if it's just going to be an empty narrative. Um, and of course, I think with regards to the US, it would be at least as far as possible, keeping an open mind and seeing that this might be a trend towards larger grievances and how this can also be addressed in US policy to better align with these new global trends and hopefully work towards a space that's mutually beneficial in a global arena that is sustainable for everyone involved. Thank you. And Michael? To me, it comes down to power, security and alignment. So if the power of the members increases, if their security remains the same or increases, and if they achieve higher levels of alignment uh, in what they're trying to achieve, I think that you're going to see a, a much more successful BRICS. And I think ultimately one of the factors that's going to shape that is going to be U.S. foreign policy. So if U.S. foreign policy pushes the countries towards greater alignment, threatens the security of the countries in ways that aren't constructive, um, or in some way indirectly or unintentionally increases their power, um, that's going to lead to the outcome of a stronger BRICS. Thank you. And thank you, Ambassador Ray. Thank you to our panelists. And thank you to our members and supporters who are online. If you're not in one of those categories, please consider supporting us. These events, as I always say, are free to you, but they're not free to us. Thank you again.